Great. Hello, everyone. My name is Sabrina Terry. I am the Chief of Strategic Programs and Development in CRC. Thank you for joining us today to discuss the Fellowship for Equitable Development and our exciting new partnership with the Goldman School for Public Policy at UC Berkeley. Just a quick reminder before we jump into it that NCRC's Code of Conduct does apply to this webinar and that you know throughout the presentation today, you can feel free to submit questions um, in the um, chat or in the Q&A section of the Zoom screen, and we will definitely answer them in a follow-up conversation or at the end. I'd like to move on by saying that, you know, as many of you know, this is the second year of the Fellowship for Equitable Development, which aims to match talented graduate students with our outstanding members to advance equitable development strategies in BIPOC communities across the country. This program was specifically structured so that both students and organizations can benefit from each other's expertise and passion to make a difference. Um, the Fellowship for Equitable Development um, was really NCRC's way of acknowledging um, and or acknowledging that many of the issues that we work on today are, um, I should say, interrelated and profound and will take years, if not generations, to really reconcile or address. And because of that, uh, we really wanted to make sure that we were thinking about how to engage the workforce of tomorrow. Um, just a quick stat, in less than five years, uh, Generation Zers will make up more than 20% of the workforce and millennials or Generation Y, depending on what you call them, will make up more than 50% of the workforce. So embracing the generational shift that's taking place within the workforce and providing targeted professional development opportunities to empower the next incoming champions of equitable community development is really central to what the Fellowship for Equitable Development is about. Um, it's a part of NCRC's guiding values um, to support our coalition members to really build community-based power. And we believe that by connecting students um, to our members that we are then helping to build that community-based power and also increase the sustainability of the work that we do over time. So our partnership with the Goldman School of Public Policy, we are able to actually expand this fellowship opportunity in Northern California. And we believe um, after several conversations that the values of um, the Goldman School of Public Policy really does align with the values of NCRC and our membership network, and that is a value add for everyone involved. And so we are very excited to share more about the opportunity with you all today, more about what we're looking for, how you can apply and address any questions that you may have. So thank you for taking the time out and we hope that you find this a, a, an enlightening experience experience. And from there, I will pass it off. Thank you so much, Sabrina. We are so excited to be here today. Um, I am going to just ask Cecile to move to the next slide. My name is Ann Campbell Washington, and I'm Senior Assistant Dean for Academic Programs and Dean of Students at the Goldman School of Public Policy. And I want to just uh, first take a moment to introduce you to the team of folks who are here today to present this exciting opportunity and talk through um, some of the program aspects. First, I would like to introduce Cecile Kapakunkin. Cecile? Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Annie. I'm the Managing Director of Career and Alumni Services at the Goldman School, um, and part of my role is to work with students and our faculty um, with these exciting projects that we're going to share more about with you today. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions, um, and I'm excited to um, pursue this partnership with all of you. Thanks, Annie. Thank you, Cecile. Hector? Uh, hello, very nice to meet you. I'm on the faculty at the Goldman School of Public Policy, and I'm also the uh, uh, the faculty director for the Masters in Public Administration. And um, I teach the capstone, one, you know, several capstone sections. So I over, oversee the way that the students are carrying out their capstone assignment. This is a real pleasure to be here and very excited to to get some of your uh, your fellows. Thank you, Hector. Erica? 
Hello, everybody. My name is Erica Weisinger, and I am a professor of practice at the Goldman School. I also oversee several capstone sections, so I really have the pleasure of getting to see um, students interacting with clients and producing work that is relevant in the real world and helpful to clients and also an instrumental part of their learning experience here at the Goldman School. Thank you so much, Erica. And on behalf of the Goldman School of Public Policy, I just really wanted to express a giant amount of gratitude to Sabrina, Terry, and the team at NCRC. Sabrina had the opportunity to meet with our Dean, David Wilson, uh, which is where the idea for this partnership was born. And I'm, I'm very grateful and we're excited to share more about it with you now. Cecile. So just to give you a tiny bit of history on the Goldman School of Public Policy, uh, our school was founded in 1969, and it's one of the very first public policy schools in the nation. We are ranked often as the number one public policy analysis program in the nation by U.S. News and World Report, and we're proud to um, hold that title, but also to be at the number one public university in the country at, at UC Berkeley. Um, we really take pride in the fact that we are a public university. We're serving California, we're serving the country and serving the world. We are a professional school preparing students for diverse careers, whether it's in development practice, domestic inter or international policy, or any um, sector. Frankly, our students go off and work in uh, the public sector at the local, state, national, international level, as well as the private sector and nonprofit sector. And we're thrilled to be uh, partnering with you in this way. Cecile? So uh, the exciting opportunity that was born out of, uh, of this relationship is that we every year um, uh, require our students in their final semester before they graduate that they must take on a capstone project. So in their final semester, they are taking on a client project and really serving as a consultant with that client to complete a capstone project. The goals um, for our students are that they conduct research and analysis to inform recommendations to that client organization that they're working with to solve a specific and current real world policy problem. And the deliverables um, can be many, but for sure they will deliver a final report as part of their capstone, their capstone report. But they also can be required to make a presentation to their client. They can be required to make a presentation to the client's uh, constituents. Um, uh, it really can be a broad set of deliverables that the students are asked to complete, but they will be outlining their evidence-based recommendations with actionable solutions to the problem that you have identified. Cecile? So the proposals uh, that you will come up with as the client, you will come up with a proposal that starts with a problem statement. So we ask the clients to really um, hone in on what is the problem or perceived problem that's facing your organization or the communities that you serve by, uh, by really taking the time to outline that problem. You're setting your, yourself up uh, with the student to be able to tackle that problem and really get you to something that will be meaningful in the end. We ask that that proposal is intellectually and analytically challenging. So it must involve a policy or a programmatic choice that you are facing um, and it is something that you are actively seeking an answer to. Um, and, that, and that problem should really require qualitative or quantitative data analysis in order to develop alternative solutions or recommendations. And Hector will get into um, a little bit more detail about the proposal requirements. Thank you, Hector. Thank you, thank you, Annie. Um, yes, I think it's, sometimes it's easier to talk in the negative and say what it shouldn't be, right? And because there's a little bit of confusion sometimes. Uh, it shouldn't be a literature review, right? This is not this is not a theoretical exercise. It's, it shouldn't be a literature review it shouldn't be uh, something that is part of uh, somebody else's work. It has to be sort of self-contained so that the student can take ownership of what they're working on. And most importantly, it has to address a real problem that you really want an answer to. And uh, idea, and, and it shouldn't be either an answer that you already have, like you just want confirmation of something that you already think, 
but rather it's an open-ended problem that you want to deal with and you would like some advice and you would like somebody to go deep into the issues and give you some ideas about how to solve it, what are the alternatives that could that could make an impact, and then put it all together for you in a in a really nice nice package. That's that's essentially what what we're looking for in a in a capstone. So I think Erica, you're going to sure. Uh, Yes. In terms of in terms of the program structure, um, the first phase is in the beginning that people are creating project proposals and selecting students, um, and then refining that with N with an NCRC member organization. Um, in phase two, between January sixteenth and May third, um, the students will be actually engaging with the project um, and completing the project with a member organization in consultation with the GSPP faculty advisor. Annie or Cecile, do you want to add to this? Yes, we'll pass it over to Cecile now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just to go into uh, dive deeper into um, each phase of, of this program. Um, so the, the, the very first kind of milestone is, is coming up in a few weeks, and, and that's the deadline to submit proposals, which is on October 2nd, 2023. Um, and, and during this period between today um, and that deadline, um, we are open to um, NCRC members reaching out to us if they have questions on um, how, to, how to construct um, their proposal, if they have questions about scope or, or anything um, to help you uh, uh, prepare the best proposal possible that would be attractive to our students. Um, we're here to provide assistance with that. Um, and so um, we we definitely want to make sure that that any any questions are answered for you in this stage. Um, and then after the deadline um, to submit proposals, um, that will become the period where students will review the projects that were submitted. Um, by NCRC members, um, and they'll apply to to those projects that they're interested in. So they'll have about two week a two week period to apply to proposals that they're interested in. Um, and then after the application period, um, NCRC members will review any student applications that were received, and the Goldman School will will manage that process um, and send applications and batches to organizations. Um, that have submitted proposals, and at this point, it's it's really up to 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 the to the member organization to decide, you know, which students they would like to interview or get to know better um, in terms of um, deciding, you know, who might be the best fit to work for their project. Um, at the end of and then at the end of those interviews, um, the NCRC member would actually select the student. Um, to work on their project if they find someone who is, is a, a good match for, for the work that they want done. Um, and that deadline to um, select a student for your project is November 3rd. Um, once everything is all in place and the student has accepted to do the work, um, then a little more work um, can, can, can be done between the student and, and the organization um, during the month of November to further define or refine the project scope. And that can also be done in consultation um, with the student's capstone faculty advisor. Um, and then at the end of the day, by December 1st, um, all of the project scope um, and, and a, an agreement in writing um, about the work that is to be done should be in place by December 1st. Um, there is flexibility with these dates if, if you know, um, an organization finds themselves in a situation where they need more time. So always feel free to reach out to us um, if that's um, your situation. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, during, during this first period, the proposal submission process, um, I would be the first point of contact um, if you have any questions or would like um, some assistance, and then 
um, we will um, determine who is the best person um, to help each organization. Um, moving on to phase two, which is the, ex uh, the very exciting part where um, organizations will, will actually see the students start working on the project, um, as mentioned before, in consultation with our capstone advisor. Uh, they will be working throughout the spring semester, which is about 15 weeks long, um, you know, starting off with, you know, further defining the problem, determining, you know, data sources that are needed in order for the student to, to really dive in and, and dig deep um, on any kind of data analysis to see what's really, what's really causing this problem and how can this data inform any kind of alternatives or recommend it recommended solutions um, that will in, be outlined in a final report. Um, part of the, the, the work that's done during, during the 15 week semester are definitely regular check-ins between the student um, and the client organization. Um, and, and that schedule um, would be finalized and agreed upon between the student and the client. Um, and again, throughout this whole period, um, the students will be advised by their faculty advisor. Um, and they'll also be given periodic assignments along the way, um, just to make sure that the students are, are staying on top of, of everything um, and moving towards um, progressing to finish the project. Um, in April um, is usually when there's a draft version of the report that's due both to the student's capstone instructor and also to the client organization for review and feedback. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, throughout the, you know, the couple of months before that, that you're not seeing um, interim drafts of things. So the student would be sharing um, drafts throughout the process. Um, the final deadline to submit the final report is May 3rd in 2024. Um, and um, final presentations would happen at some point in early May as well. Um, so hopefully um, it's, it's a big, broad overview of the two phases of this project. Um, and I think at this point, um, all of us are, are ready to answer questions from, from anyone who has any. Thank you, Cecile. So I can see that there are um, five member organizations here. Oh, okay, good. I see someone's uh, submitted a question there on the Q&A. So we'll take a look at that. How much grant money is the NCRC member org awarded? So I'm not exactly sure the... Um, about the uh, about the question here, but the... Um, uh, what do I want to call it? The agreement um, that's being developed is between uh, NCRC and the Goldman School of Public Policy to um, uh, be able to uh, pay the students for for working with the member organization um, on this client project. Is that correct, Cecile? So I don't know that the that there's um, any requirement of the member organization. Katie, can you help me here? Because... Yeah, sure. Okay, um, thank so you. Just to clarify, um, there's actually not money that goes in either direction for the NCRC member. There's on the one hand, um, the NCRC member does not need to pay um, right. the fellow, right? Um, and on the other hand, um, the NCRC member is not receiving a check from either Berkeley or NCRC. The, the benefit, the value of this program is the, the work and the project that the fellow is performing for the NCRC member. And then, um, you know, we are paying um, that that stipend um, separately so that, the, that our member organizations don't have to incur that cost um, to make sure that that work that that fellow is doing is being um, uh, supported. 
Thank you, Katie. You stated that very eloquently and I was struggling a little bit, um, but that is a benefit um, to the NCRC member org um, because uh, very often the clients that take on our students are paying them directly that stipend. But in this case, that stipend is being paid by NCRC. So that is the benefit to the member organization. And it looks like there's another question here. Do you have an expected enrollment for the number of students and projects? Would you like to take that, Cecile? Sure. Um... Of all of our graduating students who will be doing this project, there, there are about 140 students who are looking for a project. Um, and then um, for each project, it would be one student working with one organization. Um, so hopefully that answers your question here. I think uh, the question is actually the number of NCRC member organizations that are being funded through the agreement. Yep, and I can, I can answer that as well. That's helpful. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, 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 your answer was good. And I think it's really helpful for our members to know that this is part of a broader, you know, on, on both sides, right? Like for NCRC, we offer this fellowship across the country and we're doing something unique with y'all and in the Bay Area. And similarly, y'all have a larger program, um, uh, but we have a very specific target that, that we're hoping to support um, five of our member organizations in this first iteration of this, and then um, revisit that partnership and um, see if there's room for expansion. Um, and I think there's a little bit of flexibility, but just in terms of, you know, our capacity and, and um, learning as we go, um, that's the, that's the aim. Thank you, Katie. Okay. The next question um is so the fellow internship is non-paid on our end. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the dual response from both institutions. Yes, that is correct, Taylor. So from the member standpoint, this is uh, no cost to you. And just to be clear, that's something that, you know, as NCRC has been listening to our members and um, trying to understand what y'all need to be successful in the work that you're doing on the ground, um, creating a just economy, um, an extra pair of hands, an extra smart brain, don't have the money, you know, for another position, but I just need more, more bright minds um, applied to the problems of my community is the thing that we've heard over and over again. And so this broader fellowship program is a way for us um, to provide that support to our members. And we're thrilled, thrilled to be able to continue to grow that program. Thank you, Katie. And I will uh, just piggyback to say, please do not hesitate to reach out to Cecile. If you're thinking about a project and you're not quite sure how to form um, that project scope, Cecile will be so happy to help you. And she will also be able to reach out to our faculty advisors, either Hector and Erica who are on today or the other faculty advisors who teach the Capstone Project course. And they're more than willing to have that type of one-on-one -on -one conversation with you about how to um, perfectly frame uh, a capstone project to make sure that it can fit into the not just the structure that we've talked about, but also the time frame, which is that spring semester time frame. I see that there's a question. Can we provide two or three problems in advance of submission for feedback on which problem would be most applicable skill sets of the students? Mike, um, that is a great idea. We love that. <laughs> we love to um, receive possible questions and give feedback on them. Um, I was thinking it could be helpful for us just to walk through an, a scenario or an example of a type of question that students might respond to. And I actually have a a problem that I've been thinking about a lot that I wish a student would work on. I wish a city council person in my neighborhood would, would ask for it, um, and I might suggest it. So the problem I've been thinking about is in my neighborhood, which is historically redlined, we don't have a lot of trees. And we do have a tree planting program in the city of Berkeley, and trees are planted by request of homeowners. So this pretty naturally disadvantages neighborhoods where there are um, a higher density of, of, of rentals because landlords may or may not 
be connected or just may be concerned about the maintenance and upkeep of a tree. Um, so if a student were to take on this type of problem, they would first what we do what we call assemble some evidence. So really think about the tree canopy in a community. What are the um, benefits of trees? Who's requesting trees? Where Where is there the most tree density? Um, so that would be the first stage of kind of defining the problem, assembling some evidence. Um, and then from there, perhaps think about, you know, more equitable ways of, of figuring out how a city could um, strategize about tree planting, um, present some options based on values, um, and then ultimately make a recommendation. So that would be an example of a type of policy question um, that that a student might work on in a in a master's thesis. So that's that's a hypothetical. Um, does, would it be helpful to maybe give another example, like Hector, maybe if somebody that recently did something wonderful <laughs> in your <laughs> case? Yes, certainly. Well, we had a we had a student who did a really good uh, project, and she was looking at how do we reduce the number of shootings in a in a neighborhood, right? So she was looking at she was she was looking at Berkeley, and she was concerned about that. And she said, "Well, we have we've had an uptick in shootings, and uh, you know some of them cause death, some of them cause injury, but many of them don't cause any of that. They just are disturbing to people who live in that in those neighborhoods." And so similar to what Erica mentioned right now, she first started by understanding the problem. Where is it that this is happening? Uh, how, how many of these incidents actually lead to somebody getting injured or 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 or, or dead? Um, is it concentrated in certain areas specifically? Who does it affect? Who are the people who are most at risk of being injured or being distressed by this, right? So she looked at all of this stuff and uh, she had some very interesting insights. One of the insights that she realized is that, uh, yes, while this was happening in certain communities that were uh, you know, mostly uh, communities on the west side of Berkeley uh, that are heavily minority inhabited, it was also true that it was mostly minority uh, community members who were most affected by this, right? And so her thinking about it completely changed uh, because her initial view was, well, whatever we do, we don't want to have more police, right? And then as she started looking into it in a, in a more detailed way, she was, wait, wait a second, the people who are suffering the most, uh, you know, are precisely people who are, uh, you know, underprotected. And so then she started looking at that and looked at different options and what could we do community policing? Could we have more community organizations involved to try and prevent this kind of stuff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So she came up with a, with a list of, of very interesting uh, recommendations that took from different areas. It wasn't just one uh, approach. It wasn't ideological and it wasn't uh, cookie cutter. She actually tailored something that was going to work for those communities in that place at that time. And that's that's sort of the kind of stuff that we want uh, people to work on. Thank you both for sharing those. Any other questions? Kitty, will our uh, slides be shared to members who weren't able to attend today and the, and the recording also? Yes, and um, actually that reminds me, I did want to share, um, well, this will be on a slide as we close, but um, for folks to be able to see directly the um, the landing page, the um, where we've got all the you know a, a lot of information oh, about fantastic. the community, um, and then we'll add this um, the slides and the link to this recording. Um, we'll live there as well. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today and to talk with people directly. We really appreciate it. We're very excited about this. I think it's going to be a great partnership. Well, and thank you guys, um, you know, our, our friends at Berkeley for um, taking the time to walk through and answer questions. Um, and thank you for um, members who have joined us. Um, you know, as I said before, you know, we really were excited about this opportunity to expand our members capacity um, and also get to participate in helping to form the next generation of leaders in this field. Um, so it's a um, it's a win-win all around. 
Um, really excited to see the proposals that come through and the great work um, that um, is uh, moved forward uh, because of um, this opportunity. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Katie. Thanks. Thanks everyone who came today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.